demonstrated by my wonderful husband, Jimmy Bartolo. I wanted to show a little bit of the art as well as we reading these things. school. She saw herself in a puddle and looked away. The goblins didn't look away. Their mouths filled up with saliva as they watched her. There was scant cover for them in the leafless hawthorns along the road, and Kizzy should have seen them. Of all the girls in this unremarkable town, she should have been the one they couldn't get, the one who knew better. She had old world blood, after all. Her family believed in things in vampires and the evil eye, in witch soldiers and curses, and even talking foxes. They believe that black roosters are the devil in costume and that fruit grown out of season should never be trusted or tasted. And of course, they believed in goblins. They just said there was no believing involved. They knew, because Kizzy's grandmother had saved her sister from them once in the old country and lived to tell. She'd never tired of telling the story, how the goblins had tried to force her mouth open and cram in their unnatural fruit how she kept her jaw clamped tight against them, how swollen her lips had been after. As bruised as windfall plums, I could smell that sweet nectar all over my skin, but I never tasted it, she had told Kizzy many times. You never want to taste their fruit, sunshine. It's not like there are goblins here, Nana, Kizzy had replied one time, bored of the story, and bored of this town with its soulless mall and soccer fields, its house is all as alike as cookies in a bakery box. Goblins probably get to live in Prague and Barcelona where they have like coffee houses and absinthe and, and she trailed off, groping for her daydreams, for the many coveted things to be had in other cities in other people's better lives. Blind street musicians was what she came up with. And, and, and mean little nuns carrying bread under their arms and cathedrals with gargoyles and catacombs. You know so much, her grandmother had chuffed at her. Goblins living in Prague, silly girl. Goblins live in hell. I need to tell you that they only come here to hunt. <laughs> if Kizzy's grandmother were alive, she would have seen the goblins crouch behind the trees. She would have heard the smack and gluck of their juicy mouths and kept Kizzy safe. But she wasn't alive. She had gone into the unknowable last summer. Besides the swan's wing, they buried her with other things she'd need, her pockets full of almonds to eat, a compass for finding her path, and coins for bribes along the way. And of course, the dainty stiletto blade she'd always carried in her pocket, that went in her coffin too. When Kizzy was a little girl, she had asked once if she could have that knife when her grandmother died, and her grandmother had answered, Sunshine, I'll need it where I'm going. Get your own damn knife. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes Kizzy imagined her grandmother knife fighting her way down the long tunnel of death, but mostly her daydreams were of a very different nature. She daydreamed of slow dancing with Mick Crispane and of sitting on his lap at lunch while he hugged her around the waist instead of Sarah Ferris, his knuckles resting lightly on the underside of her breasts instead of Sarah's. She daydreamed about having slim ankles like Jenny Glass instead of peasant ankles like the fetlocks of a draft horse. <laughs> about smooth hair instead of coarse hair, sleek hips instead of belly dancer's hips, about a tinkling laugh and a butterfly, butterfly tattoo and a boy who would tuck his hand into her back jeans pocket while they walked and press her up against a fence to suck her lower lip like a globe of fruit. Kizzy wanted it all so bad her soul leaned half out of her body hungering after it and that was what drove the goblins wild, her soul hanging out there like an untucked shirt. She'd probably have been flattered to learn someone wanted her that much, even if that someone was a goblin. <laughs> Some of the goblins have tails and whiskers, went her grandmother's story, Antlers and snail shells and gills, hooves, claws, beaks. Creatures they are, each as different from the next as God's creatures in a zoo, but they aren't gods. They all work for old Scratch and catch his souls for him. And they almost had my sisters. She was ready to give it for just one more taste of their fruit. 
She was a lot like you, Sunshine. May Rennie was always fierce with wanting something, a new scarf or a brother's guitar or a wink from the handsome blacksmith. And when the goblin men came through the glen, calling out soft like doves cooing, come by our orchard fruit, come by, she wanted that too, and she had it, handfuls and mouthfuls of that witched fruit. She said it was sweeter than honey and richer than wine, and maybe it was, but it near carved her hollow, because it's all she wanted after and all she thought of day after day, like it was a drug that shrank her mind to a little nub of want. And she wanted and wanted and wanted after it, but she couldn't have any more. She haunted that glen looking for the goblin men, but she couldn't see them even when they were there. I could hear their cooing, coaxing voices and see their ugly shadows tramping up the hill. And so could our cousin Penelope, but not Mireni. It's how they do. Torment a girl with wanting and lure out her soul like a snail from its shell until she can barely feel it anymore, and it seems like a skimpy, worthless thing to trade away. At this point in the story, Kizzy's grandmother used to shiver over her memories and touch her lips, remembering how the crowd of goblins had turned on her when she went to save her sister, their creature eyes flashing in the gloom as they jumped on her and held her down, mashing grapes and figs against her prim, clenched mouth. The goblins can't just take your soul, sunshine, she had said in her thick accent. You have to give it. It's an old agreement between God and old scratch. Older than eggs. A soul that's taken unwilling spoils like milk and then is no good to anyone, not even old scratch. That's why he grows his evil orchards. Because once you've tasted his fruit, you'll give anything to taste it again. And there's only one thing he wants. Mayreni had been ready to give that one thing. But instead, her sister had braved the goblins and come home bruised and bleeding with the pulp of that evil fruit still sticky on her skin. And Mayreni, wasted and white, had clung to her and wept. She had kissed her and tasted the juice on her skin, the juice she was supposed to give her soul for, sipped for free from her sister's skin. When the spell had been broken, Marin had lived. Kizzy had never met her, but her grandmother said she looked like her. There was a single sepia photograph of a girl in a doorway, full-lipped, with eyes that seemed to sparkle with secrets. Kizzy had always been fascinated by her. Truth be told, she had always identified more with that wild girl who almost sold her soul for the taste of figs, and with her grandmother, who kept her lips tight shut and never hungered for forbidden things. But though she stared at that photo and even saw the shape of her own eyes and lips mirrored back at her, Kizzy just couldn't see herself in that long ago girl, ripe and thrilling and flush with a weird species of beauty the young have no vocabulary for. Kizzy was so busy wishing she was Sarah Ferris or Jenny Glass that she could scarcely see herself at all, and she was certainly blind to her own weird beauty. Her heavy, spell-casting eyes, too wide mouth, wild hair, and hips that could be wild, too, if she learned how. No one else in town looked anything like her, and if she lived to womanhood, she was the one the artist would want to draw, not the Sarahs and Jennies. She was the one who would someday know a dozen ways to wear a silk scarf, how to read the sky for rain and coax feral animals near, how to purr throaty love songs in Portuguese and Basque, how to lay a vampire to rest, how to light a cigar, how to light a man's imagination on fire if she lived to womanhood, if she remembered her grandmother's stories and believed them, and if none of the host of other things befell her that are always out there on the fringes of worry, like drunk drivers or lightning or zombies or a million other things. <laughs> but Kizzy was ripe for goblins, and if anything got her, it would probably be them. Already, Gwen had tracked her perf the perfume of her longing past the surly billy goat to peer in her bedroom window. Already, it was studying her every move and perfecting its disguise. And then in closing, chapter two begins. On Monday, there was a new boy at Kizzy's school. <laughs>